Welcome, I'm Stephen Winnick of the American Folklife Center of the Library of Congress. For many years, we've presented the Homegrown Concert Series featuring the best in folk music and dance from around the world. In the year 2020, because of the global pandemic, we shifted to producing an online video concert series, which we call Homegrown at Home. So 2021 was our second year of homegrown at home concerts. By way of introduction, I'll mention that the United Society of Believers in Christ's Second Appearing, more commonly known as the Shakers, emigrated from England and settled in revolutionary colonial America in 1774. And from their inception, the Shakers composed thousands of songs, dances, hymns, and anthems, which were an important part of Shaker worship. Sabbath Day Lake Shaker Village in Maine, established at the height of the Shaker movement in the United States in the 18th century, is the last active Shaker community in the country. And one of that community's members, Brother Arnold Had, actively carries on the oral tradition of singing Shaker songs, which goes back over 200 years. So we are very happy to have Brother Arnold with us. Thank you. Happy to be here. Now, Brother Arnold has been collaborating with our other guest, Kevin Siegfried. Kevin's choral arrangements of Shaker songs are frequently performed by modern vocal ensembles, and he also does archival research and work in the Sabbath Day Lake Library, and sees his choral arrangements as a form of musical stewardship, helping to safeguard and bring awareness to this important American musical tradition. So our concert offered a glimpse into the transmission, history, and meaning of Shaker song and Brother Arnold's relationship with Kevin. Brother Arnold demonstrated songs and explained their provenance, and Radiance, a Seattle, Washington choral ensemble, performed Kevin's arrangements. Now we have an opportunity to delve deeper into Shaker songs and spirituality with Kevin Siegfried and Brother Arnold Had. So welcome to you as well, Kevin. Thank you so much. Great to be here. Brother Arnold, I, I think for those who maybe uh, don't know you, I think it, it would be really fascinating maybe to hear about um, your earlier life and how you first encountered the Shakers and what motivated your, your decision to join the faith. All right. I was born in Springfield, Massachusetts in 1956. And the story, although it should be straightforward, has taken a lot of twists and turns. And I've only actually discovered bits and pieces of it in the last year or so. So my family, my father's family had been deeply entrenched in Springfield since 1858 when they emigrated from Canada. And it turned out that my great, great grandfather, who was the first French Canadian police officer in Springfield, encountered the Shakers first. And he helped Elder George Wilcox of Enfield, Connecticut, to retrieve some stolen property, which were horses and a wagon. And he actually encountered them a couple of other times during his long career. That, of course, was lost to me in, in all of my history. I just grew up a pretty normal middle class kid uh, in the late 60s, early 70s. And in that time period, that whole longing and desire for something that wasn't the norm of our parents came to the forefront of my life. And certainly, I did not like the capitalistic society. I didn't like what it was doing, what it had done. And, I started looking for alternative ways of living. Uh, I was always instilled in being very religious. My parents were, were Methodists and we were very involved in our church, multi-generations of our, of our family in that church. And so there was a, a deep sense of God that had to prevail in my life and would help me to be directed somewhere. Well, anyways, um, when I was a kid, one of the big things we had to do was endure tedious summer rides out into the countryside after supper. And usually this would be done with my father's mother. And we would usually end up around Enfield, Connecticut, because it was still very rural. And the Shaker community at that time had been part of the Enfield, Connecticut prison system, but it was being run as a prison farm. So they had cows and every, everything about it was just really, really almost like it had been when the Shakers were living there. And my grandmother, who was wider than she was tall, had a tremendous fondness for food. And she remembered that she would go um, to the Shakers to have their famous chicken dinners. And the other thing she talked about the Shakers was one brother in particular named Ricardo Belden. And brother Ricardo was very handsome and my grandmother thought he was very handsome. And that played into it. Well, he had a, a 
falling out with the elder of the church, and he and another brother left. They ended up in Springfield, and in fact, were living next door to where my grandparents were. So she got to know him a bit, but that's all I knew about the Shakers. And my parents were very, very historically minded. So while I'm the oldest of three, and for our three birthdays, we, we hit every single historical place in all of New England. In the particular year, it was in June, it was my brother's birthday, and we went to the restoration at Hancock. So I had a wonderful tour, and this guy told me all these things I didn't know anything about the Shakers. And during the, the discourse, she also said that Brother Ricardo, who was the last male Shaker at uh, Hancock, was a lifelong Shaker. And I didn't know that was not true. And I was 16 years old, and I went to her and I told her, I loved it. Thank you. You've opened my eyes. This has been so wonderful. But there's one thing that isn't right. Brother Ricardo was not a lifelong shaker. He lived out for probably 10 years. She told me I was wrong. Well, I have a lot of faults and uh, those don't go away. But the worst one I had was don't tell me I'm wrong when I'm right. And especially being dismissed because I was only 16 and therefore, you know, I was of no consequence. So I was furious. And as I was leaving in the reception center, they had a map of the shaker world. And it showed that there were still two shaker communities extant. One was in New Hampshire, one was in Maine. I never had much fondness for New Hampshire, and I have deep and abiding ties to the state of Maine. And my father's sister was living here. My mother's family was all from here. So I immediately went home, thought about it, took about an hour to get home from where Pittsfield is. And I concluded as soon as I got home, I got a three by five card. I typed on it, Brother Ricardo Belden, born, entered, left, entered, died. And I just wanted them to fill that in. And I get a self-addressed stamped envelope with it and sent it off to the Shakers. I didn't hear anything for a couple of weeks. And finally I did. And I got a, a legal size envelope back, not my envelope. And in it was a very long letter from someone styled Brother Theodore E. Johnson. And that's the gentleman going across from where I am right there. That's Brother Ted. And Brother Ted just went on and on about Brother Ricardo because he really said the basis of his faith laid in that man. He was the first Shaker we ever met and that they were talking about the resurrection life within 20 minutes of their meeting and that it was through that friendship and Brother Ricardo stating, if you really want to be a Shaker, you have to go to Sabbath Day Lake. It's the only place that's going on. So he did. And so then I said, the heck with Hancock. I want to know more about the Shakers. And there was no literature about Shakers. So in the 20th century. So I would write and ask questions and he would answer them. And finally, in the fall of 1975, I received an invitation to come up for a long weekend, which I immediately jumped on. And that was the day after Thanksgiving. So November of 1975 was the first time I came here. And it was a weekend that changed my life. I'd never been anywhere that was foreign to me that felt like home, strangers who felt like family. I did not want to be a shaker. That was not in my, my thought process. But what could I do to help them? The community was desperately poor, really struggling. Uh, I could help by volunteering. I could help by other ways, and I would, and I did. And so I started visiting more and more. And in 77, I had most of the summer off. So Brother Ted um, decided in the very beginning of August, when I, he knew my time was getting closer to coming to an end, he said, child, we have to have a, a mature adult conversation. And that was always, of course, you don't want to hear those words. But that's what he said. And so he said to me, you have to become a shaker. You're not going to be happy. I said, I'm very happy. I love this. This is great. I'm here with you. I can be at home. I can do my thing. He said, no, you're never going to be happy. This is where you need to be. You've got to do it. And I said, no. So we had, a couple, we had another conversation. It didn't go any better. And then we had the 6th of August. And the 6th of August is the day where we commemorate the shaker's arrival in, in America in 1774. The... The 6th of August has three major events associated with it. The transfiguration of Christ on Mount Tabor, the arrival of the Shakers in North America, and the bombing of Hiroshima. Mm. So what we see in the first two is God's light giving light to the world. And the third one we see is man's light giving darkness to the world. And so that day is a very, very important day. And we have a meeting in the evening. It used to be over in the meeting house, which has no electricity. So we have lamps in the windows. And there were probably... 20 to 30 people here. And as the meeting opened up with the singing of the hymn mother, we just, there's something just happened. 
And as the meeting went on, more happened. And it seemed like the very heavens were present. And I've never been in, in such a spiritual meeting as I was that evening. And I realized during that evening that there were some spirits speaking to me too. So the next day I went to Brother Ted and I said, you're right. I'm going to, would I, would I be able to try it? The community said, yay. And so I started my journey. I'm coming up on 44 years in another week's time. And the size of the community uh, at that time, uh, approximately, what was the, how many people were there at Sabbath? Uh, I made the seventh member. Okay. It never seemed that small though, because there were always visitors. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. and so the place was always full, really too full, when you think about how few there were to take care of all the masses, but that's, that's what it was. And uh, everybody here was old enough to be my parent or my grandparent. And... As we come up uh, upon the the 250th anniversary of uh, Mother Anne Lee's arrival um, in the New World, along with uh, the people who traveled with her, um, I'm just wondering if you could paint a little picture of number one. Um, Who did um, Ann Lee come to the United States with? What was motivating that that move? Um, and just a, a little bit of what you know about the worship and music um, experience of the early Shakers at that time. This is back to back to 1774. Sure. Um, so the first believers started off in Manchester, England, and that's in the northwest corner, and it was the second largest city in England, but very far away from London. And so there was a lot more freedom there than you found down in the capital. So actually, that's where the first Unitarian chapel was established in, in England, and uh, the Presbyterians and the Quakers and the Swedenborgians, all of this free thought was flowing through. And it was also a really stronghold of the Methodists, and this is where Shakerism comes out of this Methodism. So when John Wesley was head of the church, he believed so much in the individual Christing experience, that flame, which is even now the, the symbol of for the Methodist church. So the Holy Ghost coming down upon us and baptizing us and sanctifying us. And that's what those first Shakers did. And they believed in it. They were very wild and very woolly. And they were very Pentecostal. So the, the preacher would get up and, you know, rouse the people up. And then you'd see them going into gifts, really. You'd have shouting and whirling and twirling and all those kinds of things. Well, in 1747, what you see is a, the kind of the reform of Charles Wesley kind of roping them in to be more Anglican. And you have all of these groups who wanted that fundamental founding spirit to be alive, like the Free Wesleyans and the Primitive Methodists and all that. And you have the Shakers. And so they're practicing in house churches, and there are probably 40 or 60 people who were attending these things. There was no form. They would sit and be quiet. And then, as the Spirit moved on them, people would get up and whirl and twirl and have gifts. They'd speak in unknown tongues. They'd sing in unknown tongues. They'd roll on the floor, whatever the gift would be. It was highly charged. And it was these people who come to America and who are very British in 1774, which is a really bad thing to be. And so they're there in the wilderness and they just basically stay there and wait. And Mother Anne keeps saying to the followers, you know, have faith, we gotta grow more crops. But nobody comes, Mother. She said, they're going to come. They're gonna come like doves, just have faith. And then on May 18th of 1780, you have what's called the famous dark day. Millions of acres were burning out of control in Quebec and nobody knew what that cause was. So in all of New England, the sun was neither seen to rise nor set. Of course, here are people who are very, very attuned to the book of Revelation. And everyone in New England thinks this is it. The millennium's coming. We're, we're in trouble. And so the Universalists, the Shakers, and the Free Will Baptists, all that day found the church, as it were. They make a public ministry. And so people heard about this, again, going back to Revelation, the book, uh, the book of Revelation, The Woman in the Wilderness. And so people hear about her and they come and then they go back and they bring more people. So you have thousands of people coming here to Waterville to be 
to hear the message, to be fed on the message, and then to confess their sins, open their minds, and become believers. So it's all done Pentecostally. Mother would speak to them individually. Sometimes she was sweet as honey in the comb, and sometimes she was hard as flint. And she could read a soul and know how you how she could get through to them. She decides to make a missionary tour uh, where she gets these groups of people that she, people she knows are going to be friendly and open, gather more people in, and just went throughout New England. And she gets to Harvard where she really feels this is it. This is the place I have seen in vision of God in, Amer in when I was still in England. And so she makes her headquarters there. But she faces the most brutal, brutal prejudice and physical violence. Uh, she was in prison. She was beaten. She was dragged down the stairs, making sure that her head hit every single step. She was tossed in wagons. She was physically abused because people said no woman could be like this. So they would tear her clothes off to prove that she didn't have breasts. I mean, there was just outrageous, outrageous behavior by, by the people around her. And finally, she gets so tired and, and she goes, they decide to go back to Waterville, New York. And uh, while there, not intending to stay, I do not believe, she was always going to go back to Harvard. But her brother, William, died, just exhausted from all of the persecutions and beatings. And he dies in July of 1784. And mother at that point just starts to let the life flow out of her. And so on September 8th of the same year, she passes. Now we know because they were buried in land that eventually was not ours. So Mother Anne and Father William were not buried on land that eventually became part of the community of Waterbury. They shifted away from there. So they, in the 1820s, they, they, picked, they exhumed the bodies and moved them. And they found that Mother had had a fractured skull, which is in keeping to the kinds of beatings she endured. So then, then it goes into the Americans, really. Well, Father James gets it for a few years, um, but he is a young man from England and very, very vigorous and strong. And he starts to have people understand they've got to leave the world and start coming closer communion. And that's when more meeting houses are being built in various sites. And, but he dies in 1787. So from that time onward, what we primarily think of as being shakers and shakerism is an American experience. Who were the converts? They were primarily free will Baptists. And the free wills um, were different from the Calvinists, just because the name indicates that kind of thing. And they were looking for light, more light. And so during that second great awakening, they have all these little churches around who are seeking out really what it is to be redeemed, to live the life of Christ. So they were perfect, fertile, uh, ready land for the Shakers to, to come into. And they accepted them wholeheartedly. And so this is how they, they join the church. And who's the head of the church, first American head? Father Joseph Meachin, himself a former free will Baptist minister. And it is he who sets us up in community. It is he who says about the equality of all people and, and things. It is he who reveals the duality of God. And so from the very beginning, this is where we have equal and separate. So the brothers take care of the brothers, the sisters take care of the sisters. And we look after the interests of each other to unite as one. Why do we call ourselves brothers and sisters? It's to remind ourselves of this relationship in Christ. Christ is head of the church. We are the children. So we are brothers and sisters, one to each other. Now, much of the music from this time period, this certainly the, the early period in the 1770s, 80s, 90s, into the into the <clears throat> early 19th century, much of it is as unstructured as you described the worship being at that time point. You have songs that are uh, the wordless songs, um, the just in, in the shedding the, the, the idea of, of, a, of a hymn or a song text that has a text uh, just because it was in, in the need to shed the theology um, of former times. And the so we have these wordless songs and um, this whole out outgrowth of a, of a very kind of new, uh, it's, it's really some, something new uh, is happening um, musically amongst the, the, those early, um, early decades of the Shaker history. And, the, um, and yet you just mentioned a, a moment ago, you mentioned uh, Father James Whitaker, um, who uh, was one of the people who accompanied Anne Lee um, in that or original group of how many people was it? 
They were eight, eight of them. So, um, and Father James Whitaker, who you mentioned, uh, dies in 1787. There are uh, there are songs, and there is one in particular that is uh, kept alive in oral tradition at Sabbath Day Lake, in an unbroken uh, oral tradition that that you still sing there. Right. Oh, the Blessed Gospel. We sing two of his songs. Uh, in Yonder Valley and Oh, the Blessed Gospel. But Oh, the Blessed Gospel has been, as you said, preserved through all time. We relearn, thanks to Dr. Daniel Patterson, in Yonder Valley in mm -hmm. the 1980s. Mm -hmm. So and that's still, and that's a very favorite song here. But I think Oh, the Blessed Gospel, which is one of uh, our dear friend Lenny Brooks's favorite songs, and he asked for it oftentimes in meeting. So <laughs> it's kept alive that even our friends know that song too. Yes, could you could you sing that song and uh, for us? Oh, the blessed gospel! Oh, the blessed gospel! It shall be mine. Oh, the blessed gospel! Oh, the blessed gospel! It shall be mine. I will labor for it. I will labor for it. It shall be mine. I will labor for. I will labor for it, it shall be mine. You can see how that a tune like that has been able to, to hang on all of these years. And the of the of Father James's songs, that's certainly Oh the Blessed Gospel and In Yonder Valley that you mentioned, have words. There are many other just really arrestingly beautiful songs of Father James's that are um, preserved in uh, the uh, Russell Haskell manuscript at mm. the at the Library of Congress uh, in the Music Division. That um, those songs are other songs in that manuscript have no text. Also beautiful, but that it, it can it's it's clear how this one has hung on. Um, and and can you describe a when is is there a, certain occasions or certain gifts that in worship where you this song comes up when you sing this I think, well of course when we sing them in meeting it's sort of be supposed to be an amen to someone's testimony so you know maybe someone is talking about the gospel life there's an easy plug in there um union that comes up a lot so that can plug it way in there or sometimes just lenny gives the testimony and because you know it's his Favorite song, you pitch it up and make him happy. Um, and so it goes on and on. And remember, these songs were meant to be sung over and over. These little couplets were easy to learn because they would be repeated and repeated and repeated, mm -hmm. uh, keeping the, the rhythm for the, for the marching and the dancing and all of that. The other, the first parents, Father William and Mother Anne, are known to have a lot of songs too. But like you said, they're just vocables. And then when Father Joseph takes over, he he purposely does not want to hear words because all he's getting is old heaven's religion and he wants none of that. So, you know, he he just beats it down. And in fact, he actually stops marching towards the end. He just the march went so slow that it just stopped. And for the last two years of his life, there was no movement in meeting at all as he tried for them to labor deeper inside of themselves. But then Mother Lucy takes over. Mother Lucy was much more joyous person. He was he was very dour and you know very very Baptist, and she was not. And when winning the West as she did early on in the eighteen uh, hundreds, they brought in a whole long uh, repertoire of hymns, and that's what millennial praises ends up being. But it also spurred off a revival at Mount Lebanon because they were so happy to get all these new brethren and sisters. So these become very lively songs. And some of them have a mixture of words and vocables or just still vocables. Uh, but then that's really where the, the words start having more legitimacy and they start to becoming the way to go from there on. And the, and the words in the songs at that point um, uh, also become more uniquely shaker. Mm -hmm. Yes, in their in their perspectives and their in their metaphors and um, just the language as a whole. And right now we're talking about roughly what time period? Where well, this eighteen twenties and twenties is where this this sort of this coalescing starts to to occur, right? Mm -hmm. in, in terms of of maybe what we think of today as a uniquely shaker song uh, in the style. Um, 
There's another song um, from the from the 1820s um, that you have um, referred to as um, the first song that was learned by Sister Mildred Barker, right. uh, Come Little Children. And um, I'm wondering if you could just tell maybe just a little in, a little bit about uh, Sister Mildred and uh, the importance of this song for her. Sure, Sister Mildred is the, is the other one there <laughs> above me. Uh, she was the eldest of the community when I came here. She was placed by her mother at the Alfred Shakers in 1903. And uh, as Sister Mildred would tell it, Eldest Fanny gave her to Eldest Harriet at the second family. So it was Eldest Harriet who had her in her room to teach her some Shaker songs. And the very first one that she ever taught her was Come Little Children. Now, if you think about that in the early 1900s, it's kind of odd anywhere else but in Maine for them to be teaching these kinds of old songs. They had all gotten into the Canterbury mode with the four-part harmonies and, and all of that stuff. Whereas this is a very simple, folksy kind of song. Well, why do they keep it? They needed it because the Alfred Shakers were still marching. So you hear certain rhythms and certain beats that are used for certain songs. And you had to have them to make that particular dance work. So Come Little Children was something they still used in exercise meeting on Wednesday nights. And um, so easy for her to learn. And once Sister Miller learned one song, she said she just couldn't stop. She just had to learn as many songs as possible. It became something of an obsession for her. And so that's why she was the living embodiment of the Shaker spiritual. And she knew thousands and thousands of songs. Um, many of which she recorded for Dr. Patterson and eventually come out on a couple of records that we produced, but she knew even more. Uh, unfortunately, they didn't get recorded. But thanks to people like you in particular and Marianne Hagen, et cetera, uh, you guys can read our, our lateral notations. So you can translate it and say, hey, this is a gem you, you need to know. Uh, so our repertoire still grows and that's a wonderful thing. So. Yeah. And of course, when you sing Come Little Children, you think about Sister Mildred. And that's how a lot, so much of the songs actually survived because they had a personal association with someone. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So how does that song go? Come Little Children. OK, this is a song which when we sing it, we'll, we sing it through twice. Um, but they would have sung it many more times. Every time you sing it, it picks up tempo. Is that right? Okay. Yeah. And, so, and you knew when it was going to end because nobody could go any faster. <laughs> Flaps, but, so, but we just do it twice now. Uh, come, little children, come to Zion. Come, little children, march along. Come, little children, come to Zion. Come, little children, march along. And your clothing and your dress shall be the robe of righteousness. And your clothing and your dress shall be the robe of righteousness. Come, little children, come to Zion. Come, little children, march along. Come, little children, come to Zion. Come, little children, march along. And your clothing and your dress shall be the robe of righteousness. And your clothing and your dress shall be the robe of righteousness. And it's very easy to imagine that um, maybe starting slower and uh, being repeated and repeated until it just works its way out. I love that that image then of the you, you can you you can hear the, the 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 physicality of that as that as that plays it plays itself out in the room um, with people uh, marching and the, the, you mentioned earlier um, the exercise meeting um, which is uh, something that developed, um, I don't know the actual dates of this, but I'm assuming it's around this similar time period of the 20s. But, but, but the, um, I'm wondering if you could speak a little bit to that, since that's, a, that's a, something very unique to, to the Shaker experience. And also, as it, it seems to be, it, you know, it was an outgrowth of the fact uh, the that you know movement and the you know the the fiery uh, kinds of 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 bodily movement that you were describing that you know that goes back to the very early shakers in Manchester, 
and the that you have the 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 organization of that movement and the codification of it and the sort of controlling of it um, into um, very very exact and precise uh, kinds of uh, dances, quick dances and slow dances and marches and shuffles and uh, and a whole body of songs that accompany those tunes that were meant to be sung to those. Um, but the exercise meeting itself is something not, it's not unique to Sabbath Day Lakes, it's something that was happening in all the communities, yes. Um, and just a little bit about that, because that was that was a, a particular day when that when that happened, and this was a time to to focus on that that activity of movement. Yes, right. So that would have been Saturday night. Sometimes you hear it called prep meeting, mm -hmm. and it really is a kind of rehearsal for Sunday when they'd have public worship to make sure everybody was in tune and in union with the right steps. And sometimes it was to learn a new dance. You know, whether it be a ring dance or a square order shuffle or whatever it might be, however it was playing itself out. The square order shuffle was the very first unified dance step that believers ever had. That came from Father Joseph. Father Joseph, because he was a Baptist, he had this thing about law and order, like you have no idea. Everything, everything in our life was square, square order. Well, he hated the bedlam of worship. He, he just could not stand that. And so... He said he had a revelation of God and above their heads were the angels doing the square order shuffle in perfect union. And so uh, he introduced that first step and that became the only step for a long time. But then when those lively things came out, the square order shuffle didn't keep up to that. That was not its purpose. So that's when the ring dances come out and you see more lively. The dances are very lively. They're sprightly. And that's why in the 1840s, you see marches and marches were uh, more regulated, they were slower. And uh, they had drill-like precision with them. And that's what exercise meeting was really important then to make sure all the ranks were, were going at the right number of steps before they turn and everybody was doing it in perfect union. So eventually what happens over the 1890s, you hear about a walking march. Now this is what's happening. You know, the community is aging. Uh, there, there's just not so much energy anymore left in the room. And then finally you have what's called a sitting meeting. And so that's when, and every community did it at a different time period. The larger, more wealthy communities seem to be the first ones to abandon that form of worship. Whereas the smaller, more independent minded ones continue on for longer periods of time with the exercise, which were mostly marches at that time. It certainly uh, makes sense that the, with the level of precision that was expected, right? And it required for those things to 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 come off right that that it would take rehearsal it would take these, these things don't just happen right that yet you would be able to you know make this right angle right you know at this beat and everything's in synchrony and um and that's certainly the you know one of the things that you hear because many of these not the exercise meetings which you say were like those were a, a, a closed um, thing for the community, but for when um, when worship uh, Sunday worship meetings were open to the public, that's certainly uh, the historical accounts that you read from the time period in the 19th century. Of course, there's a big emphasis. That's one of the things that people really remark about is the, this, their experience of the the incredible. Um, precision and uh, control um, that plays itself out. And the, um, and the, um, also the, the continuation of that exercise meeting, can you just, um, I know that's for, for the main communities, for both Alfred um, and for Sabbath Day Lake, um, those continued for longer than than many other communities. Right. Well, um, Sabbath day, late 1907 and Alfred right to the Sunday before they left in May of 1931. Which is, which is uh, certainly something that impacts in a big way um, the musical traditions of the, both of those communities and certainly something that I've seen 
in going through the manuscripts from both Alfred and Sabbath Day Lake is the um, the uh, you know march tunes and, and in particular those continue um, and the feeling uh, of the of the march continues in the music. So mm -hmm. that we have that, that the way that that physicality expresses itself um, in the music is unique. And and when um, and in other communities, when that when that tradition fell off, uh, that um, that that also fell off. Right. <laughs> we also lost that mm -hmm. quality uh, in the in the music. So we have a, a continuation of that in the main communities, which is I think is a really that's a re it's a really crucial detail and aspect of the tradition that you are, you know, that you are holding there. Very much so. And, you know, uh, behind me is a reed organ. And that that's mm -hmm. what I did everything. So main shakers did not want those at all. They, they wanted nothing to do with uh, what they saw in keeping in the tradition with mother about worldly instruments being introduced into worship. Whereas the Mount Lebanon and Canterbury in the 1850s, they started, you know, started using them and started writing music more in the, in the case of the world. So using those things, they didn't march with them anymore. They just, you know, they were singing. So uh, Elder Otis Sawyer in particular was adamant about not having organ music uh, among believers. And he said that the human voice was still full and sufficient for the praise of almighty God, mm -hmm. exclamation point. Now, when he passed in 1884, then Elder John Vance of Alfred takes over. Elder John felt the same way. And it wasn't until he dies in 1896, and that's the year, um, when he comes in, when he dies, they let organ music uh, happen at both Sabbath Day Lake and Alfred. And and it really stopped the flow of music. So there's almost no compositions there after that year. Uh, they they stopped using stopped receiving those gifts. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And so that the the introduction of the of the organ uh, in uh, which happened much earlier in the um, in other communities at uh, New Lebanon and Canterbury, um, and and you see the. So that's also I I can definitely uh, verify the the thing you're you're describing is you see the a drastic a drastic change in the in the style um, of the of the music of both of those communities mm -hmm. uh, when the when the organ was introduced and so you have um, then an interest in studying four part harmony um, and um, and you, and uh, and you hear the 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 music has has a has an awareness of chords, and um, and the, and the folk style is is um, is more or less out the window, and mm -hmm. and you really it's it's when a more or less you know Victorian um, right uh, kind of um, hymnody is brought into the Shaker community. So and and the organ certainly is the thing that. Um, it, and it was brought in right for, in many cases, for support, right, as, as communities were dwindling. But it also, it 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 it, it was a double-edged thing in that in that way. Yeah, it certainly was. <laughs> um, and um, the uh, going back to what I was just saying that in terms of the folk style, we talk about that the folk style of, of Shaker song and, you know, what that is um, to musicians that often means that there are you, there's a use of, of gapped scales, you know, pentatonic uh, or six, five, six note scales. Um, there are melodies that were, that weren't um, um, written with an awareness of chords. Um, uh, whoever received that melody wasn't thinking about how am I going to accompany this, right? Um, and um, it's it's a somewhat akin to um, chant almost before you know in the medieval period where where the where the the focus is on melody. Mm -hmm. the melody tells the melody carries carries everything, and the um 
So the there is a beautiful song um, from the 30s from Maine, I Hunger and Thirst, uh, which is one that was featured on the, um, the program that um, we put together earlier this year for the Library of Congress. And um, I think that's a great example of this uh, when we talk about the folk style of early Shaker song, so the early uh, 19th century, um, I think this this song is is just I, for for anyone listening, it would give us a, a, a give us a good um, reference point for that. I'm wondering if you could talk and sing that song. I, uh, I hunger and thirst. I hunger and thirst. Right. That that uh, song was one that it stays in my mind. No one could sing it as well as Sister Mildred when she could sing it alone. It was just something she understood from the depth of her soul. And she just projected it through her beautiful voice that she had. But she also said, there's nothing more difficult to sing than a shaker song because it goes from the bottom of your feet to the top of your head. Mm -hmm. And as you were saying, so they weren't thinking about music theory here. They were just thinking as, as they received it from the spirit, that's the way it was supposed to be. Mm -hmm. And we'll struggle through and we'll miss some of the notes. And as it goes older, we'll round them down a little bit or bring <laughs> them up a bit. So they, they continue to kind of expand. But this it is a beautiful song. This was one of Sister Francis' favorite songs, too. So we used to sing this in meeting quite a bit. Mm -hmm. I hunger and thirst. I hunger and thirst after true righteousness in what I've obtained. In what I've obtained, my soul cannot rest. I hunger and thirst. I hunger and thirst after true righteousness. In what I've obtained, in what I've obtained, my soul cannot rest. An ocean I see without bottom or shore. Oh, feed me, I'm hungry, and rich me, I'm poor. I will cry unto God, I never will cease, till my soul's filled with love, love, perfect love and sweet peace. An ocean I see without bottom or shore, Oh, feed me, I'm hungry, and rich me, I'm poor. I will cry unto God, I never will cease, till my soul's filled with love, love, perfect love and sweet peace. Yes, that certainly is a classic, isn't it? And mm. it's, so, it's so universal. Um, and that Dorian style, that, that mournful kind of style that believers were just laboring and laboring in that time period. So uh, it, it's very, very deep. It is. It is. And it's one of those those qualities that really, I think, that really strikes people when they when they hear Shaker music, that it, it goes deep um, and has this level of authenticity to it um, that is very, it's very unique too. Um, and the, I think that, um, I mean, we, we need to address the, always the, the elephant in the room, which is. Yeah. <laughs> that would have to be uh, simple gifts, right? Yes. Everybody comes to me and if they don't hear simple gifts, they are some upset. We don't it, during the pandemic when it's been so quiet and just been us more or less, we don't sing it at all. <laughs> That's the odd thing. But yes, yes. Uh, it's our claim to name. Uh, it's right. a new song received by Elder Joseph Brackett, who himself was brought in as an infant into the society. He served every position of authority. And he was a just a genuinely wonderful person who had a deep, deep soul. And he wrote, he received many, many songs. We only sing a couple of them today, but certainly Simple Gifts is the one that was discovered by the world. Mm -hmm. And it does epitomize everything. It comes out of the, the revival known as Mother's Work in the 1840s. And it epitomizes what believers are called to be about humility and simplicity. 
and how important those two things are. Coming down in a place just right. Most Christians are always looking for mountaintop experiences. Well, the Shakers are farmers, and they know mountaintops are barren. We don't want those things. We want the valley. The valley is where there is good soil. And also the valley represents that humility of coming down, of our constant need to turn. And this song was actually given to him in a great time of turmoil in his own life. Elder Otis Sawyer, who was his second in the ministry, was going to be taken from him in the elders' lot. Then he had to be brought to Sabbath Day Lake because the two deacons had absconded and they had no one to replace them. So they had to put Otis in the, in the office. So Elder Joseph was given this song during time of great tribulation in his life. His second, Otis Sawyer, was going to be taken out of the ministry and he was going to be left alone. And the two of them, by all accounts, were the best friends that each other ever had. And they knew each other's mind and they could soothe each other out. And the 1840s in Maine was not a good time for us. We were under a great deal of duress and stress because most of the members didn't feel united with the era of manifestations. We had been removed as a real community and we were put under Canterbury. Uh, so we were second class citizens. And more and more of the people were really, really not liking the situation. So there was a lot of grumbling and discontent and problems going on every which way. And so Joseph being left alone in that case was really, really devastating to him. So this song reemphasizes what he should be focusing on, sort of the, the genuine principles of the gospel and to put them into practice. Now also, Aaron Copeland took this as we all know, and it gets very stately and it's grand and it's beautiful, but that's not what it's supposed to be. This is a quick dance. This was Elder Joseph was remembered as his tote tails a flying when he sang this song. So, and it's also one song that we still know the, the dance to, uh, that's been continually, that has been brought down to the, to the community today. So we still have the motions that go along with the song, although we don't generally use them. But. Mm, I and, didn't know that. So the, so you, the, the, but those have been passed down from. Right, right. From um, Sabbath Day Lake had a tradition of doing it and that was shown and it was exactly the same song and the same pantomimes that the Alfred Shakers used. So we know uh, that we've done it. We've done it here uh -huh. now as a community. <laughs> so the, you're you're certainly welcome to sing a strain in the in the in the tempo. You can reclaim the tempo from Aaron Copeland. <laughs> Thank <laughs> you. <laughs> Tis a gift to be simple. Tis a gift to be free. Tis a gift to come down where we ought to be. And when we find ourselves in the place just right, we'll be in the valley of love and delight. Tis a gift to be simple. Tis a gift to be free. Tis a gift to come down where we ought to be. And when we find ourselves in the place just right, we'll be in the valley of love and delight. When true simplicity is gained, to bow and to bend, we shan't be ashamed. To turn, turn, will be our delight, till by turning, turning, we come round right. When true simplicity is gained, to bow and to bend, we shan't be ashamed. To turn, turn, will be our delight, till by turning, turning, we come round right. And that was Elder Joseph Brackett's Simple Gifts, written 1848? Correct. 1848. And um, to, um, as a composer, I feel like I have to also um, recognize the um, the thing that happens since I have uh, arranged so many Shaker songs for uh, for choirs in particular. Um, there is something that happens that. Um, in setting a shaker song, um, if one is adding harmonies, it also it requires many times a tempo change. <laughs> in, or, yeah. in in order to let the in let in order to let those chords um, ring, or what, and so there there are certainly uh, there are many cases um, where uh, I set a tune which I know is sung faster um, or has been sung faster traditionally, and end up taking it considerably slower so this is a great place for us to um to uh, wrap up our uh, our first 
uh, half of this oral history, um, part one of this oral history with Brother Arnold had at Sabbath Day Lake. And um, thanks for tuning in and please join us for part two. And thanks again. Thank you, Brother Arnold. Thank you.